We welcome each of you to the Plum Street Temple this afternoon as we celebrate the life of the Honorable S. Arthur Spiegel. We especially welcome honored members of the bench, of the judiciary, of the legal community, of family and friends who are grateful for each of your presence here on this day. As our service begins, the colors are presented and posted by the Marines Communication Company of the 4th Marine Division. Ancient words of the Psalms. Adonai mi yagor bohalecha mi yishkon bahar kod shecha. Holech tamim ufo el tzedek vadover emet bilvavo. O Lord, who may abide in your house, who may dwell in your holy mountain? Those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth within their hearts who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless but honor those who revere God, who give their word and come what may do not retract, who do not exploit others, who do not take bribes, those who live in this way shall never be shaken. In the words of Psalm 90. O oh God, you have been our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains came into being, before you brought forth the earth and the world from eternity to eternity, you are God. You return us to dust, decreeing, return you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as we watch in the night. You engulf us in sleep. We are like grass that renews itself at daybreak. It flourishes anew. At dusk, it withers and dries up. The span of our life is threescore years and ten, or by reason of strength, fourscore years. They pass by speedily and we fly away. So teach us, therefore, O God, to number our days that we may acquire a heart of wisdom. Turn to us, O God, show mercy to your servants. Satisfy us at daybreak with your steadfast love that we may sing for joy through all our days. Let your deeds be seen by your servants, your glory by their children. May your favor, O God, be upon us. Establish the work of our hands, that it may long endure. These words from the pen of the psalmist speak to us today of the legacy, the strength, the upright spirit, the color, and the wisdom of the heart that we know in the Honorable S. Arthur Spiegel. 
Today we join together from different backgrounds to come to this sacred place, so beloved by Judge Spiegel, representing generations of personal family history that have worshipped here in this historic space. And we, his friends, his colleagues, those from the legal and civic community, neighbors, all of us come together to embrace his family and to share with them the sense of loss that is felt and to celebrate as well the spirit of gratitude that we all shared in lives that were touched by this marvelous and extraordinary man. Today we celebrate the life and the deeds of Judge Spiegel, a man who taught us and who taught so many people by word and by deed. Of the greatest generation, he exemplified its spirit in so many ways. Judge Spiegel was a true patriot, not only one who fought courageously for our country in times of war and in great danger, but a patriot who was a passionate believer in the contours of justice and compassion, goodness and hope that our nation has stood for in its founding and in the government that our Constitution has shaped. He was a defender of the oppressed because he believed that America was called at its best to that role. He had the courage that justice requires and as well the heart of compassion that tempers it with goodness. He was at the same time both a humble and a proud servant of that role. More than the great honor of serving on the federal bench, Judge Spiegel believed that he was deeply honored to uphold the faith of our founding fathers in the capacity of our nation to govern itself in a manner that granted rights and protected them with fervor. His work as a judge was always more than the case which was before him. For indeed his passionate faith in the Constitution and in the American spirit was a mission for him. A mission of service and leadership and justice. One to which he was not only appointed so many years ago, but one to which he felt himself deeply called. I share excerpts of his own words from his autobiography, A Trial on Its Merits, and I quote, I am an optimist and a believer in miracles, not in a religious sense, but rather in a political sense, as in the miracle of our Constitution and democracy. Over 200 years ago, the American colonists created the greatest revolution in the recorded history of human affairs, one that continues and grows today. We survived the Civil War and World War I, becoming an industrial nation in the process. We weathered the Great Depression to build the greatest military force in history and win World War II. Modern day miracles continue, including passage of the GI Bill for returning veterans, the establishment of Israel, the peaceful collapse of communism without a third world war, elimination of apartheid in South Africa without a civil war, and the peaceful advance of the civil rights movement in this country. The Marshall Plan for rebuilding Europe and Japan following World War II could also be considered a miracle, an example of the victors helping the vanquished. I believe that people with dedication and goodwill and the freedom to exercise both can shape events and overcome disaster as Americans have done in the past and will continue to do 
in the future. Judge Spiegel believed in miracles which he witnessed, but also from the list that he recounted, some of those miracles that through his efforts he helped to shape. Today we celebrate, as the psalmist says, his heart of wisdom, the legacy of the many relationships cultivated with goodness through the years. He was a mentor to many, sharing of his wisdom, his experience, and the wonderful smile of his that drew us near to him. We marveled at his strength of will, his characteristic deep determination to confront any challenge or obstacle, his dedication to work and his energized spirit were a friend to him throughout the decades. He was always stubborn and courageous, with a strength of spirit that kept him devoted in his work and in his passionate pursuits of flying and painting and riding, adding to a deep reservoir of ideas that was flowing until his last day. Judge Spiegel enjoyed laughing with others and seeing them laugh. We smile at the color of his life, lived boldly and without pretense. Clearly no one could ever apply the word conventional in the same sentence, even the same paragraph with the name of Art Spiegel. And we were all richer for that. Today, several speakers will offer tributes of love and respect and honor to a remarkable man of justice and conviction and passionate commitment and faithful belief. The words that they speak will help us to frame our mem memories of the Honorable S. Arthur Spiegel, recalling his steadfast spirit and his heart of wisdom. I would first call upon Louise, and as I do so, I simply want to draw upon Art's own words, who remarked, and once again I quote, it has been a great journey through life, but none of my happiness or success would have occurred but for the undying love, leadership, and support of Louise. She is the only woman I have ever loved. She has shown me the way to a good and fulfilling life, firmly, lovingly, unselfishly, and deserves all the credit for the happiness we have enjoyed together, supporting each other, our family, and the many others we have touched in our journey together through life. End of quote. Louise, all of us thank you for the strength that you gave to Art and for the sharing of the fullness of his life and of his love with all of us. So it is my pleasure to call upon you now. And we will remember Art forever, but I am here only at the microphone to thank you because you represent all aspects of Art's life. And it is a tribute that we as a family will never forget. Art in this sanctuary that has so much to do with his own personal family did much of his thinking here. Whenever he was quiet, he was somewhere with all of you. We had a long and marvelous life. And he was tough, I'm tough. And so we argued and we carried on like nitwicks. But it was a challenge to each of our hearts and our minds for the things that we care about. And today, I'm only able to tell you how thrilled I am that we're together. Everybody in this beautiful sanctuary because you represent what America really must stay and become. So many people of so many interests and so much talent. And I would hope that 
I will remember that looking here is really what America is all about. And ours had a great deal to make all that happen. So our family thanks you all very much. It's a pleasure for me now to call upon the Honorable Michael R. Barrett, United States District Judge, to offer remarks on behalf of the court. Thank you. I have a tendency sometime in situations like this to uh, speak quickly, so if I start racing, Mayor, just put your hands up like you do in court, okay? And, uh, and I'll know to slow down. My first substantial encounter with the judge was over, what, 10, 20, 25 years ago, and we butted heads for about two months in his courtroom on the eighth floor. We were both pretty stubborn, but he won. He had the leverage, a valuable lesson. Sometime after the trial, he called me into his chambers to discuss, uh, how should I put it, his judicial philosophy and how he and I got along in the case. Uh, during that conversation, the words stubborn Irishman may have been muttered several times, I can't recall, but at least once. We soon put the trial behind us, and our conversation began to turn to Cincinnati history and politics and everything else you can think about, but especially about his deep affection for my Uncle Bill, who, like the judge, was a World War II veteran and spent much time together talking about that situation as only veterans can. Thereafter, from time to time, he'd call me into his chambers and we'd talk about all things, usually about Cincinnati. And then when I joined the bench, he made it a point to stop in with great frequency, see how he was doing, and to offer help, advice, and guidance. He served as a mentor, truly. Therefore, I'm touched to say a few words on behalf of our court family. And I really believe in our district, using the word family is not a misnomer. After all, Susan, Sandy, Tim, and I worked together in private practice and spent a lot of hours together. And we took our leads, I think, from Judge Spiegel and Judge Weber. Art set the prime example in his collegiality. He had a genuine affinity for his staff and law clerks, past and present, court security, court personnel, and lawyers who appeared before him. One need only walk through his office and look at the portraits and paintings or have attended the Potter Stewart Inn of Court last year honoring Judge Spiegel to understand this. The Inn had requests from clerks, staff, and lawyers to speak, which if we were able to accommodate it, the program would have lasted for days. It was a wonderful affair. And regarding the end, while Judge Rubin gave it life, Art made it breathe with his commentary, insights, and the way he approached it. I had mentioned before portraits and paintings. Another love of the judge, as you all know, was painting, and I believe that each of our chambers and many of your law offices contain at least one Spiegel piece. I got my Spiegel piece on my 60th birthday. He came down to my chambers, handed me a very small portrait, but it was nice, it was very nicely done. A small portrait and with a smile he said, I tried to capture your smirk. I, <laughs> I said, Judge, I don't have a smirk. He said, yes you do, look at the painting. <laughs> Leverage once again, folks. Some of our colleagues sign orders in particular colors, blue, red, purple, and green. Art's particular color was green ink and I inquired as the origin of that. Apparently, Judge Porter had left a handwritten note in green ink on his bench for art. It contained Socrates' advice to the judge, to hear courteously, answer wisely, consider soberly, and decide impartially. Trial lawyers will confirm this was so. Just a quick story for insight into Art's personality, and then I'll sit down and be quiet. He and I were driving to lunch one time in northern Kentucky as our group gets together with the Kentucky judges on a frequent basis, which again adds to the whole family atmosphere we have in our courtroom, in our courthouse. And Tom, thanks by the way. Everybody here owes you a debt of gratitude for making sure that Art kept up the lunches the past few months. Thanks a lot for that. Anyway, we're driving and we talked to, started talking about flying. And he told me he'd stopped flying because there had been a crash at the Blue Ash Airport. And after that crash had occurred, you guys may remember reading about it, two small planes collided. He said the house got a number of phone calls with people that had been concerned about his well-being and whether or not he may have been involved. Based upon that, his takeaway was if flying was concerning so many people, he would just quit. And apparently he did. Sometime after that, the chief got a call from Mrs. Spiegel who expressed her concern about Art's driving. As did anybody who ever was in the garage with him, yeah. 
Anyway, the chief came down and saw me, and we decided on uh, a game plan based upon, upon the flying story he told me. It was simple. We'd go to his chambers, talk about how much we cared, and knowing our concern, he would quit driving. So Judge Weber, the chief, and myself took lunch up to his chambers. I think Judge Weber started the conversation. We went around the circle. We all expressed our concern. And to our relief, he said, well, if that's all this is about, no problem. I'll never drive again, knowing how much you guys care about me. That's that. We walked out higher in kites because we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Well, found out later he drove home that afternoon and for months thereafter. <laughs> Leverage again, you know. Anyway, in closing, uh, for me, the Potter Stewart Courthouse felt different on Friday. We loved him and we miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Barrett. Now we welcome Bob and Karen Hebenstreet, who have shared for some time a love of painting with Judge Spiegel. We're, we're the Hebenstreet team. We do everything together, right, Bob? That's right. <laughs> and we did everything <clears throat> together with the judge on his request that we come here and talk a little bit, bit about his interest in art and the art world. And um, along with my wife, Karen, <clears throat> we had uh, probably about 20 years spent that time uh, with, with the judge painting and drawing and his interest in, uh, in what he wanted to do. And it all started with uh, my wife, Karen, when she first met the judge at the Art Academy. Right. He, um, he came, I, I was told that uh, I had a new student by the dean of the art academy, which never happened before. And uh, they, she said, now, this is Judge Spiegel. And I said, OK. Um, because I've had, I've had a lot of CEOs and whatnot in my class. And I thought that was unusual. She said, now, he needs to know what he has to do. And I said, he just has to show up. And uh, this is life drawing. And he did. He came in, and right away he said, hi, teach. <laughs> And, and uh, I said, hi, and we had the class, and he, um, I would tell him, I tried to advise him what to do, and he would say, oh, I'm, I know that. I'm getting around to that. And after a while, I just said, just listen to me. Just please listen to me. And, um, of course, he wouldn't do it. And, um, <laughs> and then at the end of the class, he said, um, I bet you don't know who I am. And I said, Art Spiegel. And he said, I bet you don't know what I do. I said, federal court judge. And then there was this long silence. <laughs> and he didn't know what to say. And I had him. And after that, we were really good friends. <laughs> well, after he uh, took that class with my wife uh, at the Art Academy, he decided he wanted to landscape paint. And I happened to have a class that went out during the morning hours. Uh, one day a week, and so he uh, started taking that class with me. He was able to set some time aside. And so we painted for a while uh, in, outside when the weather was nice and at our studio on uh, Gilbert Avenue. And then at some point, I remember exactly where, when it was, but he decided he wanted to set a complete day, a whole day aside for painting. And so we selected on Monday uh, where he would paint with, uh, with me and occasionally with Karen. And uh, we would go out and paint in the parks around the city. And it was kind of interesting because after we did that for a while, I would uh, find out the next day that there was a picture of me and the, and the judge in the paper in the Enquirer. And I thought, how did that happen? Because I didn't see anyone around. Sometimes we would paint just the two of us together and no one around, in either in Spring Grove Cemetery or uh, some of the parks like Ohms Park or Alt Park. But there was this picture of us in the paper, and I always wondered how that got Yeah, that there. was great, because yeah. uh, you don't, artists have a hard time getting in the paper and getting any visibility. And I said to Bob, you need to take art wherever you go when you paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked out. It was pretty nice. But uh, he was an interesting uh, painter, too. When he painted, he wanted to paint a painting in a day. He didn't want to carry on to the next week or any time after. And so he was very quick to paint, and he worked in 8 by 10, 9 by 12 size canvases. 
And when we weren't painting outside, if I didn't have a still life for him to paint, he always had some reference, like a friend of his, someone who had just passed away, uh, that he wanted to do a portrait of. And so the, this, the, the way we painted was he gave me most of my time to work on my painting, and then towards the end of the day, he would ask if I could sit down and take a look at his and uh, make some corrections, whether it be drawing or color. And then at the end, he would sign it, and that was pretty much the day of, uh, and then if it was a portrait, he would turn that painting over to the, uh, the spouse or whoever it was he painted the portrait of. So this went on for some time, and uh, there was one time when um, we were painting our studio at the Pendleton, when the judge said he wanted to uh, take a lunch break and drive out to the Blue Ash Airport and fly to Lunkin Airport and have lunch there and then fly back. So we did that. I thought it was strange to go all the way out to Lunkin Air or Blue Ash Airport, fly back to Lunkin and have lunch and then drive, fly back to uh, Blue Ash Airport again. But we, and I was a little hesitant at first when I saw the plane. It was a cute little pipe of plane. <laughs> <laughs> and there was just enough room for the two of us in the front, but uh, it was really a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And we did that several times. And then, uh, as, as time went on, we moved into our new home where we had a painting studio, so we left the Pendleton. But at the Pendleton, he enjoyed that because there were a lot of professional artists, if you, if you know the place, a lot of professional artists, they have studios there. And so occasionally he would get a chance to talk to other artists who were uh, painting and their technique and style. So he enjoyed that a lot. At our house, he did the same thing. He painted the studio from morning to evening and sometimes so late that we'd get a call from Louise wondering where he was. And so, <laughs> but we told her, well, he's in safe hands and would see to it that he got, got home safely. Um, yeah, and as, as the years went on, he, uh, he would become uh, uh, more tired and more tired and pretty soon uh, he started appearing, he, he stopped driving. I mean, we all jumped on him because he was driving. I said, Art, you have to stop driving. I mean, you just have to stop driving because uh, it's not just about you. It's about everybody on the street, and they know your car. I mean, if you've noticed, they all pull over when they see you coming. <laughs> and um, so he stopped driving, and uh, he said, um, oh, well, he showed up with his nurse, and his nurse would come and bring him in. And uh, sometimes in the middle of the day, he would take a nap on the couch, and then he'd get up and he'd start painting again. And, and, it, and he, then he started to lose his eyesight, and then he had fell down. And I mean, it was this, as my eye doctor says, the natural progression. And uh, he uh, injured his eye, and he couldn't see out of the one eye, and the other eye he was starting to fail. But every Monday, he'd show up. And, um, people knew not to bother him because he was coming to art class. And Bob, would, you would paint with him then? You know, we'd, we'd paint, and then it was uh, at the end of the day, he would sign his paintings. But at this point, I was doing quite a bit of the work on one painting for him, and he realized that. So he said, uh, when I sign my name, I want you to put a plus after it. <laughs> so Spiegel plus, meaning me, the Hidden Street. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but was, uh, uh, we really, really yeah. enjoyed him, and he enjoyed us, and he got to know our family, and uh, it, we became, we felt like we were part of his family, and it, it's been really great knowing him, and the Mondays are going to be really quiet. Yes. Yeah, we're going to miss understand. him a lot, but he was, he was just a wonderful man, as you all know. Thank you. Now we turn our attention to Judge Spiegel's love of flying as we call upon Dennis Walter. Well, my um, getting to know uh, the judge goes way back to the 60s. I was a young kid flying around Clifton on a moped, and I saw this man building a home out of a bus, and I got to thinking, what does this fool think he's going to do with that old bus? And by God, as I watched what he was doing, I saw the creativity and the tenacity and the focus of this man, which was rare to see somebody who would go to a junkyard and get an old toilet in a tank and make a functioning plumbing system. 
pretty functioning, I understand. <laughs> and, and, and I just followed that, and then lo and behold, my sister starts dating Chip. So I kind of was in the periphery of knowing this family, but it was really through aviation that, that I got to know, know the judge. You know, with college and all, I learned to fly at a very young age, and one day Art shows up in his little airplane where I'm hanging out, and um, we would have just, just polite conversations. But in his later years, he would come to lunch with a group of us that would meet out at the airport. We called it the liar's table for, for good reason. And um, we would just share stories, people from all works of life. And to know Art in, in, in what he was as a person is to know the book that Tom Brokaw wrote, and I'm sure we're all familiar with it, The Greatest Generation. And us baby boomers are the luckiest generation for having had the men and women of, of the World War II era as our parents and teachers, mentors, and flight instructors. And Art would tell stories of how he conducted himself in the military, and he was more or less volunteered to go up in a little 75 horsepower, 70 mile an hour airplane and become the worm on the hook and fly down canyons and valleys in an attempt to get the Japanese to shoot at him. The only thing between him and these bullets was the kind of stuff we're wearing, fabric covered airplane. And he'd come back with holes in this thing, but he did that job with the same tenacity and focus and commitment that he built that bus and his law practice and his family. And I was so blessed to, to have that. In fact, his nickname in the military was Overtime. I just found that out from a friend of his, also a pilot here. Because he would stay up as long as he could and land at the last minute in an attempt to get the information. The purpose was if they shot at him, they could identify where they were. And then they'd call in all the big guns and they would obliterate that spot. Well, the Japanese figured that out, but Art said every once in a while some young recruit, you know, didn't get the memo, and, and uh, we'd, we'd take care of business. Well, I think in all that darkness, the one thing that really helped him get through that, and that was a tough job those guys had to do, particularly in the Pacific. It was a really dark side of the war, was he was exposed to flying. And I think that was the light that guided him and retained his sanity through the war. And I can say that for a lot of aviators. It's the thing that, that helps us get through sometimes a tough day or a, a tough month even on, on top. And it was a spectacular sky. And you see a different perspective from a little airplane, or I get the front of a large one, I'm sure, too. Passengers don't get to see. There's light in the cabin, and, and the windows are looking sideways. And I could see the entire universe. I could see every star, every constellation, count several satellites, and I'm all immersed in this, this sea of, of, of appreciation for nature and our creator. And all of a sudden a voice comes on the radio responding to some air traffic controller, dead ringer voice for a friend of mine. I almost keyed the mic and said, hey Ford, how you doing? And I realized Ford had passed away five years ago. So now I'm swimming in the memory of a good man who would help you do anything for you and, and um, was a great pilot and technician. And I realized that this aviation thing we do really attracts a unique group of people. I had a friend once tell me, a little too unique, you know, you might meet every nut in town if you hang around this airport for a week. But, and I said, you know, Art, considering our age, Someday I might be flying at night or pretty day and hear a voice like yours on the radio and I'll have a lot of good things to remember. And he looked at me and he said, I'd be honored. And I'm so blessed to have met men like him and women in, in aviation as well. There was a fellow named- uh, Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed, and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. 
wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I topped the windswept heights with easy grace whenever lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Art doesn't need an airplane to do that anymore. And we owe him a great gratitude for showing us how to have a life well lived. And Art, I really want to thank you for that. Thank you, Dennis. And finally, we call upon Keith Seiler to speak to us of Judge Spiegel's love of law. Ladies and gentlemen, I was privileged to work with Judge Spiegel for 11 years as a law clerk. He gave me some doozies as assignments over those years. Well, this final one takes the cake. He said, Keith, you'll have five minutes to discuss my legal career. Now, Judge was a lawyer for 32 years before he took the bench. He was on the bench even longer. So I'm sorry this assignment is impossible. 66 years and five minutes. Objection. <laughs> I have not been overruled, so I'll just attempt to do this justice. Any discussion of Judge's legal career is lacking if it doesn't start with his service as a Marine, as this defined his entire life. He was always faithful, or as any Marine would say, Semper Fi. When he fought World War II, he saw the horrors of war. He, he saw bullets miss him and kill his friends. He also saw bravery and courage and solidarity. He was only 21 years old when he enlisted, and he learned to be a fighter. In retrospect, it might be easy for us to romanticize World War II, but Judge Spiegel did not. He called it hell. He served in Pellieu, New Britain, New Guinea, Guadalcanal, and Cape Gloucester. In a tiny airplane made mostly of canvas, he identified coordinates of any pos enemy positions, he gave those coordinates to a fellow soldier, a Navajo Indian, quote, wind talker, who radioed another Navajo on the ground who translated back into English so the Americans could target their artillery fire. In the jungles of the South Pacific, Judge suffered hunger, malaria, and in one terrible episode, in the tropical heat, he helped carry the body bags of his friends over a number of days because Marines never leave one of their own behind. He often said he did not think he would have made it home from that. He found comfort at that time in the 23rd Psalm and in the Lord's Prayer, two biblical passages that he later would write, will always be with me. He did make it home though, thank God. And once he did, he made every minute count. He was always proud to say that he went to Harvard Law School on the GI Bill. He was admitted to Harvard Law after a five-minute interview granted when he showed up in his Marine uniform. He loved those newlywed years with Louise at the boarding house in Cambridge. More than 70 years later, he would still be interjecting legal discussions with concepts he learned both from Harvard and Louise. You have to be just before you can be generous, he would say. And if in a conference a lawyer repeated an argument over and over, he would protest. You're just like my wife. <laughs> Lucky for us, the Spiegels returned to Cincinnati where Judge's legal career really began. He told me none of the big firms would hire him because he was Jewish. He told me how this discrimination hurt him as he only wanted the same chance everybody else had to prove what he could do. We'll take that frustration, combine it with a fighting spirit, and what do you get? 
You get someone who would spend his entire career fighting for others. Now, of course, his career as a lawyer involved everything from representing petty criminals to representing corporate shareholders to handling probate matters, bankruptcies, and property disputes. He locked horns with lots of people, but he always served his clients well. I think he was probably most proud, though, of the civil rights work that he did, which ultimately catapulted him to the bench. He was instrumental in working for justice during the 1967 riots as part of the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission. In 1968, he sought a preliminary injunction to allow African Americans to swim at the Clifton Meadows Swim Club. His similar efforts led to integration at the prestigious Cincinnati Athletic Club. And he sued to help black tenants face down a racist landlord. Senator Metzenbaum identified with his civil rights work, and Arthur Spiegel was humbled when President Jimmy Carter appointed him to the bench. He entered into judicial duty on June 5, 1980. Judge's nomination was not without opposition. Lawyer Douglas Cole testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee that Arthur Spiegel was a hard-driving, opinionated trial lawyer with a talent for rubbing people the wrong way, and that he did not think Arthur Spiegel was capable of change. But in 1985, when Judge came under a groundless attack in the Wall Street Journal, it was the same Douglas Cole who rose up in Judge's defense. About his earlier testimony, Cole wrote, I was wrong. Cole continued, this man, through efforts I can only admire, has transcended his legal career by becoming, in my judgment, an outstanding federal judge. He deserves recognition for the effort rather than the slings and arrows of uninformed reporting. Cole's conclusion that judge become an out, became an outstanding federal judge stood the test of time. Judge would faithfully serve on the bench again for 34 years. During such time, he gently addressed criminal defendants, but he came down with thunder if anyone disrespected the court or the law. He was proud to incorporate community service into sentences when he could, like he did for Pete Rose. Judge saw his judicial role as more than a referee. He actively pursued settlement of disputes between parties, and he became famed for his technique that he called the, quote, Lloyds of London. His technique aimed to help parties assess the real risk and amounts at stake so that they could cut their losses and move on. He also championed what he called the, quote, summary jury trial, an effort to get parties to do a test run of their case as a settlement technique. Simply put, Judge Spiegel was an innovator. In civil cases, he always told me that he kept in mind that the case, no matter how seemingly small, it was the largest thing in the world for the litigants. And so he treated everyone with an untiring respect, whether a lawyer with the Department of Justice or a pro se inmate roughed up by prison guards. When people were upset enough to file a lawsuit, he said, more often than not, they deserved their day in court, and he would let a jury decide. The core of him, the Marine, remained faithful to his mission. He would work through piles and piles of documents, often working late into the evening and always taking home the latest slip opinions from the Supreme Court and the Sixth Circuit to read over the weekend. He would continue such practice even after he went blind in one eye. The wheels were always turning in his head, and so when the phone rang at 11 o'clock at night, I knew it was him. Wanting to discuss the products liability case, the criminal conspiracy, or the problem across the county with sewage and basements. And yet, I am merely one of his many law clerks who received such late night phone calls. He took each of us under his wing and he trained us. I'm going to double dog dare you to hold your breath as I go through this list. There was also Lynn, Carol, Jenny, Lark, Robert, Kathleen, Jennifer, Joan, Lynn, Sarah, Adam, Carla, David, Andrew, Stephen, Amol, Gary, Barbara, Eileen, Kenneth, Cindy, Elliot, 
Jeremy, Annie, Jeff, Eric, Sally, Rob, and Chandra. He made us all laugh. He stole food from our lunches. <laughs> and he joked about what we ate. In fact, one of the most recent things he said to me was, Keith, get some exercise. <laughs> Ask any Spiegel law clerk about their happiest moments as a lawyer, and you can bet some of those moments will hail back to their time at 838 Potter Stewart Courthouse. Judge Simmerly had a warm and caring relationship with his docket deputies, Paul, Vicki, and Kevin, and his judicial assistants, Diane and Marianne. His court reporters as well, Roger, Marianne, Jody, and Luke. He treated us all as family. We were blessed. A court speaks through its orders, and Judge Spiegel has spoken. His decisions, all signed with a green pen, are now part of American jurisprudence, and they speak better than I can here. But we all know that he was a groundbreaker. As a judge, he stood up for gay people before it was fashionable. As a judge, he held government officials accountable for everything from murder cover-ups to a bad photography project at the county morgue. As a judge, he took executive branch policies head on in the 1980s and reversed countless denials of social security benefits, thus protecting some of the most vulnerable among us. As a judge, he always looked at discrimination cases with an eye toward respecting the law, but also with a memory of his own experience. And as a judge, he was open to new theories helping whistleblowers uncover fraud against the government. Thank you, Judge Spiegel. Thank you, Louise, he could not have done it without you. Thank you, Tom, Chip, Andrew, and Roger for sharing your dad with us. But back to you, Judge, I have no idea whether you can somehow hear us today, but if you can, thank you, friend. Thank you, friend, for your faithfulness to your country, your community, your colleagues, your family, and your staff. Rest assured, you have left an enduring mark. I'm no Marine judge, but I'm a fighter. Otherwise, I would not have made it through this final assignment. So as one fighter to another, I say to you, the Honorable Judge S. Arthur Spiegel, Semper Fi. With those loving tributes concluded, as we have taken measure of this remarkable man, not contained merely by eloquent words, but whose colorful memory and whose heart of wisdom, whose passionate faith in justice in the American judicial system and its greater possibilities, all of this will remain not only as his legacy, but as an inspiration for us all. And so now, in a hymn in which we can all share, and one that meant so much to Judge Spiegel, we'll be led in song by C. Ransom Hudson, who will offer a rendition of God Bless America, and at its conclusion, he will invite us all to join in. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. God bless our 
America, land that I love, stand beside the night with a light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans wide with foam. God bless America, my home sweet. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies. To the oceans, white with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. It is a simple prayer that reminds us not merely to look back at what has been, but a prayer that reminds us to look forward when we say, Zichron Olivracha, may his memory, may the memory of the Honorable S. Arthur Spiegel be a blessing for us all. As we look forward, leaning upon his legacy that is a blessing to family and friends and to all of us. We know with assurance that our prayer is answered. For that memory will inspire and strengthen and live among us as a blessing. The ancient words of our tradition El Malera Chami, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence. Unto the honorable S. Arthur Spiegel, Im Kadoshim Utorim Kazoaharakia Mazarim. O God of mercy, let him find refuge forever in the shadow of your wings. Let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting love. Lord is his inheritance. We say, which now concludes our service and our tribute of love. A compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, on behalf of the family, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence unto the honorable S. Arthur Speak, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge forever in the shadow of your wings. Let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting love. Lord is his inheritance. May he rest in peace. And we say, This now concludes our service and our tribute of love and memory for this afternoon. On behalf of the family, I want to express their thanks to you.